Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another bow tie broadcast. Here with your host, Chandler Quayle, and today we are sponsored by Whiteout. Whiting out those careless errors and little mistakes we here at Bowtie Broadcast know all too well. So when it comes time to fix those mistakes, get white out. The only quick dry correction fluid you can count on. So, hello everyone and welcome back to another broadcast. Today we're going to be talking about another controversial topic that so often defines our views, our livelihood, our lifestyle, and the people we choose to surround ourselves with. Now, this isn't sexuality, it's not race, no. It's the third of our controversies, religion. Alice Walker, an agnostic person herself, shows us the multi-faced and multifaceted views on what it means to be a Christian in the old world self. But more importantly, Alice Walker shows us what religion can mean to each individual person. Now, it is important to note that regardless of religious preference, that religion plays an important role in all of our lives, whether adherent followers, semi-pastorbys, priesters, or atheists. Religion has in some way, and in some form or facet, influenced our lives. Regardless of what we believe in or how we choose to believe it, religion has played a role. So let's break down how religion has played a role in every single person's life, regardless of how they believe in it or if they believe it all. So we'll start out again with the protagonist of the novel, Celie. Celie, a devout Christian woman, has chosen to express her faith in a quite obvious and inherent way in her repeated letters to God. Now, if we take this out of the context of a color purple and we look at this in a broader sense, this is not surprising as we see devout Christians take, write letters to God in many ways. Maybe we remind of, hey God, it's me, Margaret where Margaret writes repeated letters to God, or the, uh, the adherent faith of Martin Luther, whose 99 theses were in fact letters to the church and letters to God, and of St. Teresa, whose letters to God from, of her missionary work have been recorded and collected throughout her time and past her death as means of seeing the very woman of faith she was. So letters play a very important role and as through her diary letters, or as we will call them from now on, letters to God, we see an evolving idea of who God is and what God can be. In the beginning, Celie views God almost like a rocky surface. We see it as jagged, rigid, of strict moral code, sharp, unwielding, unnerving, and quite frankly, so powerful it hurts. Now, how can this be conducive to a woman who has experienced sexual abuse in the way that Celie has? Well, quite frankly, it can't. And so we start off with this very rigid, morally righteous, very strong-willed God who demands perfection and the results of imperfection are pain. This leads to a lot of the inferiority complex and self-doubt Celie feels throughout the novel as how can you look up to a divine figure only to be looked down upon in the same way every other man has looked down on you. So, we see Celie shift her view of God, thanks to the help of Shug Avery, later on the novel, but we do see it before this, from a rigid and morally righteous man to a rigid and morally righteous entity without gender, but we still see a very, very rigid and morally righteous individual who has chosen to exact punishment and pain as the reciprocal and as the reciprocation for failure. Well, enough times of physical abuse, sexual abuse, and misturns, and we see Celie begin to change her idea of what it means to be an adherent to Christianity and an adherent to God. So with the help of Shug Avery, this time in a quite literal and quite meaningful way, turn God into this idea of not just an entity that exists far above and outside of the human scope of perception, but into natural beauty. I mean, if God can be the air and God can be outside of a box, 
then certainly God could be the flowers, God could be the rocks, God could be the trees, and God could be the streams. Now, if we look at this in the larger scope of history and the, and the scope of present tense, this is not surprising with many Protestant Christians, much of which dominated the South, such as the Southern Baptist and Black Baptist conventions, and the Methodists themselves have shown strict adherence to the idea that God manifests himself in nature. So the idea of Seely manifesting her deity of God in nature is not surprising nor controversial. Now what is controversial is who God is. Now if God can be flowers and God can be trees and God can be rocks and streams in the naturalistic world and God can be loving and God can be caring, well then, in Seely's eyes, God must be a woman. Now, the shock value of this at first seems, well, how can God be a woman? In traditional teachings, God's a man. God's a overwatching man who sees the world, the eyes of rigid perfection in a way society teaches us only a man can do. But for Seely, it's impossible to turn for spiritual guidance, love, and acceptance from a man when every man in her life has chosen to neglect her, abuse her, and misuse her trust. So, we see that one of the most controversial ideas in all of religion, an idea that has rocked many sects of Protestantism, and has even rocked the Christian church. And quite frankly, the Pope has even been called to answer, is does God have a gender, and can God be a woman? Now, to quote biblical text, it's quite possible, as God is quoted to not only be in, many times in the male form, but also seen as a as a gentle being and mother dove and mother swan. So it is not impossible, nor is outside the scope of reason, to God to be viewed as a, as a woman. Furthermore, if we look at the Unitarian Universalist Church, we see that they also tend to see God as not only a man or woman, but as someone who's gender fluid and who fits the ideas and needs of the individual. God doesn't have to be simply a man. God does not have to be simply a woman. God simply fits the need or the whole in one's life in any way that they need it because that is the purpose of God, to fill a hole in the human existence and to answer the deep life questions. Regardless of beliefs, that is true. So Alice Walker spins this narrative and the idea that God can be changed, manipulated, and God can be formed in order to form a God that is in fact outside of a rigid code, a checklist, a checkbox, a box culture, which to many Americans is quite shocking. Because here in America, everything we do is checkbox culture. If we say it, if we do it, if we think it, we have to run through a list. It has to fit into a list. Our whole lives have to fit into the box of, is this popular? Is this new? Is it trendy? Does it fit into the box of being hipster, crunchy, granola? Whatever box you want to fit yourself into, people are obsessed with this idea of boxes. So why should our God be any different? In the era of corporate church and the fact that modern day societal views have in fact shaped the way every century's church viewers see God and see church, it is no wonder that we see an idea that God must fit into a checkbox, and there has to be a list and parameters. But Alice Walker smashes this idea and says no, that God can exist outside this checkbox in a way that maybe only an agnostic or atheist person could see God if they were to believe. The fact that if there is a God and you're going to believe in them, well then the God has to fit this role, and the God has to fit this way into my life, because the God you're preaching about doesn't fit into my life. The God you're preaching about doesn't match the way the things I want God to do for me and doesn't help me. So in a very agnostic, outside religion, looking into religion way, Alice Walker gives us the most perfect view on who God is. God is whatever we want them to be. God is many in one. God is so many different things in one. And therefore, as we see through Seely and through the novel, God can be multiple things, even at the same time, for multiple different people, as is evident by Seely, Shug, Mister, and Alfonso, 
who all pray to very different gods, but who all represent the same thing, a hole in the lives and a representation of things they are missing. So I thank you for joining me on the broadcast today and tune in next time when we cover gender and Alice Walker's The Color Purple. Thank you.